Hey everyone, thanks for watching. If you'd like to see more Hemisync podcasts, such as Episode 8 with Dean Reagan, podcasts that aren't necessarily associated with any particular Hemisync product, but simply feature fascinating guests and subjects associated with the frontiers of consciousness research and understanding, please consider joining our exclusive Patreon page and get some great discounts on Hemisync products in the bargain. Thanks for watching. Hey, thanks for joining us for the Hemisync podcast. I'm joined today by Bernardo Castro. He's the author of six books having to do with consciousness. Bernardo is a proponent of idealism, which posits that consciousness is fundamental to all reality. His ideas are gaining traction in the mainstream, having recently been published in Scientific American. So please welcome Bernardo Castro. Bernardo, thanks for joining us. Um, you know, personally, Pleasure to be with you. Great. Um, personally, I think your writings on the subject of consciousness are among the best out there right now. And, um, I know, th and I know that you write mostly for an educated audience, even for an academic audience, but can you just kind of start off by telling us a bit about your concept of what you call monistic idealism and how it differentiates from kind of the current prevailing worldview that dominates uh, scientific thought, which is uh, physical materialism? Yeah. Well, monistic idealism, uh, at, at least uh, in formulations similar to the one uh, I put forward, is a skeptical worldview, a skeptical ontology in the sense that it sticks to what we know. Uh, there is only one ontological class, one kind of existent that we have direct access to, that we can refer to directly, and that is experience with the qualities of experience, the redness of the color red, the sweetness of strawberries, uh, uh, the bitterness of disappointment, uh, how it feels to have a bellyache. Th these are qualities of experience. And to a monistic of idealism, to, to a monistic idealist, the entire universe is made of experience. Experience is all there is. There is no abstract material world outside of experience and which somehow modulates experience, creates and modulates experience. Uh, the challenge for the monistic idealism, of course, is to make sense of certain undeniable observations, like uh, uh, there is a tight correlation between uh, uh, brain function and experience. If all there is is experience, how do you explain that correlation? Or clearly we all seem to share the same world. I, I'm not a solipsist. I believe you are conscious and I believe my, my girlfriend is conscious. The ant is conscious. Even the bacteria in my aquarium are conscious. Um, and we all seem to inhabit the same universe. If this universe is purely mental uh, or kind of a dream, how come we are all sharing the same dream? And uh, Or things like, uh, well, if everything is mental, if everything is in mind, why can't I just change the laws of nature merely by wishing them to be different? Clearly, we can't. So these are the challenges for the idealist to make sense of these observations without having to postulate uh, matter fundamentally outside and independent of consciousness. Mm -hmm. And I guess in contrast, a, a physicalist would maintain that, um, you know, consciousness is um, a... Uh, uh, what's the word? Um, consciousness derives from physical matter, and when you stack up the atoms, the molecules that make our cells, tissues, and you know, this is an additive process that happens. Um, and at some point, I guess you achieve consciousness. Yes, that's that's the physicalist postulate. So if we compare the two, uh, the idealist would say that there is only mind, and matter is a particular modality of experience mm -hmm. associated to uh, associated with associated with perception. Certain things you see, you touch, you smell, uh, those experiences is what are, are what we call matter. To a physicalist, matter is all there is. Mm -hmm. Mind or experience is uh, an epiphenomenon or, 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 or a product of certain specific arrangements of matter, certain configurations of matter that somehow, in a way that nobody has a clue, uh, generates the qualities of experience. And mm -hmm. it, is, it is this transition from matter to mind that is so problematic in physicalism. Mm -hmm. And so one of your books is entitled Why Materialism is Baloney. And you can check them all out on Amazon, right? That's the place to go for Bernardo's books. Very good. So there. 
And I definitely want to give you a chance to pimp your books, um, which are excellent, by the way. Um, and so why materialism is baloney? What are some of the absurdities that derive from um, taking the materialist position? Well, the, the first one is, is well known as, uh, as the hard problem of consciousness. Mm -hmm. And that's the idea that uh, if materialism is correct, then all there is really out there uh, is matter. And matter is characterized by abstract relational properties like mass, spin, charge, momentum, the geometrical relationships between particles. Uh, how do you derive the qualities of experience? What it feels like to have a belly ache, what it feels like to eat a strawberry, what it feels like to fall in love. How do you derive these qualities from the abstract quantities that characterize matter? Uh, uh, spin up or spin down? How much mass? Mm -hmm. Charge positive or charge negative? How do you do, how do you bridge this gap? Um, uh, 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 many philosophers claim that this gap is fundamentally impossible to bridge. It's not only that we haven't bridged it yet. It's that we will never be able to bridge because there is just a, a, a gaping abyss between the world of abstract, abstract quantities and the world of, of concrete qualities. Mm -hmm. uh, th there is nothing about charge, mass, momentum, spin, in terms of which one could deduce uh, what it is like to see red, what it is like to fall in love, and mm -hmm. so on. It, this, this bridge is arbitrary. Mm -hmm. And that's a sign, okay, that we've done something wrong. Uh, the moment we pose this problem to ourselves, this problem is so incoherent, it's so impossible that we've done something wrong before. And I think what we've done wrong is to abstract that there is a material world fundamentally outside and independent of mind and then trying to recover mind from that abstraction. Yeah. The absurdity of that is that basically matter is an abstraction of mind. So one is trying to explain mind in terms of an abstraction of mind. There is a fundamental paradox uh, in this. Uh, it's like we are chasing our own tails at light speed. <laughs> we'll mm -hmm. never be able to solve that. That's one absurdity, a well-known one. There are many others, like, uh, I'll give just one more example to keep it brief. If, if uh, materialism is correct, then the qualities of experience, which is all we know, uh, uh, are generated by your brain inside your skull. The world out there has no qualities. Mm -hmm. It has no colors. It has no melody. It has no flavor. It has nothing. It's just the only way to to visualize it is to think of it as mathematical equations, uh, completely abstract quantities. Right. Um, so your entire life, as you know it, uh, uh, this screen in front of you, as you see it, the, the the things you touch, even the stars in the sky. They only exist insofar as you experience them. They only exist inside your head. So mm -hmm. your real skull is beyond the stars in the night sky. Because the stars in the night sky, as you see them, supposedly, according to materialism, uh, are being created inside your skull by yeah. your brain. Your real skull is beyond uh, the sky. Right. Uh, and <laughs> that's absurd. It's basically saying that your entire life plays out inside your head. Yeah. As opposed to your head being in the world, it says that the world you experience is inside your head. Uh, it's a complete inversion. Which is, I guess, another way of saying that the outside world is an illusion, which I guess has a certain Eastern mystical quality to it. But it sort of begs the question of, well, if it's an illusion, who is having the illusion, right? Uh, I don't think the world outside ourselves as individuals is an illusion. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, in so, because we experience it, and insofar as we experience it, it exists as such. Right, but that's, the phys I, that's sort of the physicalist argument, right? No, that, no, well, no. Well, that no. It's, it, it, it's an abstract, it becomes an abstraction. Everything is correct. a set of mathematical probabilities, which is an abstraction. Yes. Correct, correct. Yeah. So, so, so let me be clear. Mm -hmm. I don't deny an external world in the sense of a world outside our personal individual mentation, our personal individual minds. There is a world outside our personal individual minds, mm -hmm. but this world is not outside mind. Mm -hmm. It is not made of a different thing than mentation. It's not my mentation right. alone. There is mentation out there, outside me. There right. are thoughts out there, outside me. I think the world outside is 
underlined by 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 thoughts mm -hmm. but those are not my personal thoughts those right. are the thoughts of mind at large the thoughts of nature at large right. which we register we perceive as the contents of perception right uh, what we experience on the screen of perception is the extrinsic appearance of the thoughts that underlie nature at, at large so i don't deny an external world i deny a world outside mentation itself mm -hmm. It is outside my mentation. It's just not other than mentation. The physicalist also grants that there is a world outside our personal mentation. But the physicalist goes further and say, this world outside my personal mentation is not mental. It's pure abstraction. Mm -hmm. It's just quantities unfolding according to certain patterns and regularities that they can model according to mathematical equations. Right. But it has no qualities. The qualities are all, are all created by my brain inside my head. That's the difference. And so if you took that, if you took the physicalist argument to its uh, logical extreme, and you get down to kind of very small quantities, and you get into the quantum theories, one of the theories that's evolved and has gained traction recently is the many worlds hy hypothesis, right? which um, to me seems absurd on its face because you quickly, um, so it's, it's very inflationary, right? Which means you very quickly develop an infinite number of universes to explain all these phenomena that we experience, which can much more elegantly be explained simply by um, your theory, which is that everything sits within consciousness. Can you just talk a bit about that? Yeah, so according to quantum theory, um, the world is not deterministic uh, at the quantum level. Uh, there are probabilities associated with quantum events. And, um, and these probabilities only become resolved once we as observers interact uh, with the world. Now, there's a lot of Polemic, polemic about uh, you know, what constitutes an observer. Could the measurement apparatus be an observer? Uh, it's an open discussion, but ultimately we only know if a measurement apparatus made a measurement, made an observation, when we look at the dial of the measurement apparatus mm -hmm. with our own consciousness. Uh -huh. So we only get to know what happened once our consciousness is involved. Um, so uh, ultimately then we can say, according to quantum physics, as far as we can know, the world only translates from a set of overlapping probabilities into a definite reality that we experience the moment we come and look at it. Now, there are many ways to interpret that. Uh, the many worlds interpretation says that uh, all the possibilities within that envelope of possibilities, all those possibilities actually play out just in parallel universes. Mm -hmm. And at every moment where a choice can be made, both choices are actually made and the universe branches out uh, into different branches of multiplying choices. Mm -hmm. uh, as you said, it is extraordinarily inflationary. Uh, I challenge anybody to find a more inflationary, inflationary explanation for reality. Right. Because it basically says that everything that can possibly happen does happen. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the proponents would argue that it's not inflationary in the sense that it's the thing that derives most naturally from the mathematical equations. I dispute that. I don't think it's derived naturally at all from the mathematical equations. Only if you consider natural uh, uh, what is lazy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it is the laziest uh, interpretation because you say if the equations allow for this, then this happens. Mm -hmm. And that's the other thing too, so long as it's allowed by the equations. Right. I think what's actually happen happening is that the world out there, in the sense of the world outside my personal mentation, uh, is constituted of thoughts. I'm using the word thought to, to refer to any mental category that is not perception. Mm -hmm. So that would include thoughts, imagination, emotions, and so on. So the world out there is constituted of overlapping thoughts. Mm -hmm. Thoughts can overlap, mm -hmm. even be contradictory. I mean, if I'm weighing on uh, uh, about whether I should accept a job offer mm -hmm. until I make the decision I'm living with both possibilities in my mind the possibility yeah. of accepting the job offer and the possibility of not accepting the job offer and in my mind both possibilities play out at the same time I'm imagining both possibilities so I think the world out there is constituted of thoughts in this kind of overlap and that's mm -hmm. what we call quantum superposition 
Uh, and this superposition, once we, uh, our personal dissociated minds, interact with this superposition, they interfere with one another. And what happens is that we then register a definite world mm -hmm. of all the possibilities. This interfer interference pattern of my interaction with the world uh, will reinforce only one and de-emphasize all the others. So I experience only one. Right. And that is then my personal physical world. Right. When you interact with the world, you experience your personal physical world, which is dependent on how you interact with it, how you observe it. And our physical worlds are consistent with one another. They are different, but they are consistent with one another because we are both interacting with the same mind at large mm -hmm. out there. And that's how the consistency comes. But you are in your own physical world and I am in my own. Right. So um, I guess if I could summarize, and you can tell me if I'm uh, messing this up, but um, so you give the term to um, kind of the larger consciousness system or being or presence, whatever you want to call it, you sort of refer to it as mind at large. We are each dissociated instances of that mind at large. And that degree of dissociation might vary by person, but we're all so, you know, we've, we've also become separated from that mind at large. Um, and so we each have our own individual consciousness. When those fields overlap, like you and I would both agree that we're having this conversation right now, that is sort of um, what gives rise to the events in the world that we can mostly all agree are, are happening. Correct. Um, and so this seems like a much more um, elegant way to explain phenomena. You like to make the point that one of the ways that we can determine the strength of a scientific hypothesis is through parsimony. And so when you compare this to, say, the many worlds theory, um, it seems quite a bit more parsimonious. Not only uh, for the reason that we just discussed, that the many worlds uh, interpretation would require uh, a mind-boggling number of universes, strictly it's not infinite. But it's so large as to defy any possibility of imagination. Mm -hmm. um, and also because uh, the many worlds interpretation under a materialist paradigm would leave consciousness itself unexplained because mm -hmm. of, the, uh, of the, the hard problem of consciousness. Yes. You see, a a every theory of nature has to have what we call an ontological primitive. You cannot keep on explaining one thing in terms of another forever. Mm -hmm. At some point, you, you hit rock bottom and you say, okay, at this level, nature simply is. It's simply what there is. Mm -hmm. And that's legitimate so long as you can explain everything else in terms of that thing that is, that yeah. ontological primitive. Uh, materialism, uh, uh, regardless of the interpretation of quantum physics that you choose, if you are a materialist, because you see interpretation of quantum physics is on the edge of science and philosophy, but materialism mm -hmm. is squarely a metaphysics. It's pure philosophy. It's not science. Uh, and so idealism as well. Uh, if you're a materialist, regardless of the interpretation of quantum physics you choose, you will be postulating some physical ontological primitive, like... Um, the menu of fundamental subatomic particles of the of, of, of the um, standard model, or mm -hmm. the brains of M theory, or the superstrings of string theory, or the quantum field of quantum field theory. It, there are there is a variety of options, but you always have a physical ontological primitive, and then you fail to derive mind itself, consciousness, the qualities of experience from that ontological primitive. Mm -hmm. Idealism would say, well, consciousness itself is the ontological primitive. Therefore, I don't have to explain it. It's yeah. simply what there is. Yeah. What I do have to do now is explain all the patterns and regularities of, of experience, including the fact that you seem to have a separate consciousness than mine. I have to explain all that in terms of this one universal consciousness. That's the challenge for the, for the idealist. Mm -hmm. If so, the idealist solves this, then the idealist certainly has a more parsimonious and explanatorily powerful uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, worldview. Mm -hmm. And so where do you think we are with this in terms of um, these ideas getting tra uh, traction kind of in the zeitgeist and within the scientific community? I think it's beginning to, I mean, materialism has been entrenched for arguably more, but I would say close to 200 years, mm -hmm. arguably more, but at least since the beginning of the 19th century, um, you could argue that you know, 
started back at the cards. The card, you yeah. could argue that started even earlier than that. Um, it certainly has become very, very entrenched in the 20th century. Um, and I think now it's, it's beginning to change. I mean, I, I, I have published a paper, and mm -hmm. a very extensive paper on idealism. Mm -hmm. uh, in the Journal of Consciousness Studies, perhaps the premier venue uh, in this field, mm -hmm. um, going 2,000 words uh, above uh, the word limit, the accepted <laughs> view. So and, and I'm regularly published on Scientific American, which until not so long ago had, be, had been considered a sort of, you know, HQ of the materialist paradigm. Mm -hmm. um, and they've published, they continue to publish my stuff several mm -hmm. times a year. There is a new one coming out. Um, so I think it's beginning to change. Uh, what is key, I think, is that uh, the non-materialists, the idealists, the panpsychists, with whom I don't agree, by the way, mm -hmm. um, they have to, if we are to have a chance to, to change the cultural mindset, we have to play by the existing rules. Mm -hmm. You cannot change a paradigm and change the rule book at the same time. It's too much to change. Yeah. You have to play by the existing rules. And that means you have to play by the existing rules of evidence. You have to play by, by the existing rules of, of reasoning. Yeah. Uh, you have to reason logically. You yeah. have to be grounded in evidence. Uh, um, you, have to, you have to write according to the accepted language. Use the accepted jargon. Uh, and that's where a lot of the folks who are idealists, even without knowing, like the non-dualists, the, you know, the spirituality people, uh, that's where they, they, they don't stand a chance um, because they don't follow the, 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 rule, the established rules of reasoning, the established mm -hmm. rules of evidence, the, the language, the jargon, the way of thinking, the way yeah. of presenting, the way of articulating. Uh, they don't even follow the same value system. Yeah, uh, science is largely based on a value system. Like right. uh, parsimony is better than inflation. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, th th there are values in science. Um, you have to play by those values too, which I think are correct, uh, yeah. by the way. Um, and I think only recently people started playing the game according to the existing rules to promote a different worldview that, yeah. uh, that defies materialism. And and I think it's going well. Yeah, I think that's part of what's so interesting to me about your approach is you're trying to change the um, prevailing mindset through scientific channels, through peer-reviewed journals. Um, and I guess I'm struck by how some of your critics, they seem to um, level ad hominem attacks at you and dismiss your theories out of hand, um, often, it seems, without actually reading the paper. Um, how do you <laughs> how do you deal with that? Uh, well, this is normal in the yeah. sense that it's not nice, it's not good, it's not justifiable, but it's normal in the sense that it happens a lot and it doesn't happen only to me. Yeah. So I am not the poor guy who is being you know singled out for for unfair treatment. Mm -hmm. This happens all the time. Maybe the non-materialist guys or the non-physicalists, that would be the correct term, mainstream physicalism, but never mind, we continue to use materialism. Mm -hmm. um, maybe they get more than their fair share of this kind of uh, ad hominem attacks. Mm -hmm. uh, I got one recently, you probably saw online, um, a famous professor of philosophy, uh, Massimo Piglucci. Yeah. Uh, he... he out of his own initiative, I didn't. I didn't even know him. I had heard the name, but I didn't know know, know who he was. He, I learned later that he was famous as a, a militant skeptic and mm -hmm. militant uh, materialist. He came after me, and I, I reacted, and we had some interactions via our own blogs and via Twitter. And once you. I pressed the issue, it became abundantly clear that uh, he had not read the paper yeah. that he said should not have passed peer review. <laughs> he didn't read it. Um, That's who I was referring to. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, but, the, you yeah. know, it, he looked like a fool, not me. Right. So it's okay. I'm, I'm okay that people keep doing that. <laughs> right. Yeah, no, I, I just pointed out because, you know, you, you emphasize the need to kind of play by the rules and go through the existing channels. But a lot of the folks that kind of represent uh, the established orthodoxy don't always play by the rules. Um, anyway, 
Um, so you, you touched upon uh, panpsychism, and just to kind of make this clear, your theory is different than panpsychism, which postulates basically that consciousness is in everything. Um, you're saying consciousness sits in that, or that er, that everything sits within consciousness. Um, anything else That's you want correct. to say on that before we kind of... Yeah, just, just well, to, to, to be fair to some of my philosophy colleagues, uh, yeah. there are definitions of the term panpsychism that are so broad mm -hmm. as to encompass idealism, encompass what I'm doing too. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I acknowledge that these definitions exist. I don't think they are helpful because when a definition is so broad, the term becomes useless because it encompasses so so much stuff that is different that it becomes uh, an unhelpful term. Mm -hmm. The more usual definition of panpsychism is that uh, matter inherently has consciousness. All matter, not only a, a, a biological brain, uh, uh, but a table, mm -hmm. a rock, an electron, a subatomic particle, an atom, uh, it all has consciousness. In other words, there is something it is like to be an electron. There is something it is like to be my computer. And there is something it is like to be me. Mm -hmm. uh, we say that uh, all arrange mm -hmm. arrangements of matter are conscious, or at least many arrangements of matter. Uh, uh, some panpsychists would say the atoms of my table are conscious in and mm -hmm. of themselves, or the subatomic particles that compose my table are conscious, but the table itself is not conscious as a table. Mm -hmm. It's only an aggregate of conscious atoms or, or conscious subatomic particles. So there's, there's all kinds of variations there. Yeah. But the essence of panpsychism is that matter is conscious. Mm -hmm. I disagree with that because that sort of attributes consciousness as a property within the existing framework of physical matter. Yep. Uh, so it sort of acknowledges that there is more to matter than consciousness itself, in a sense. That consciousness is an intrinsic aspect of matter, fundamental, all right, intrinsic, all right, but an aspect of matter nonetheless. Mm -hmm. And in my view, that is not the case. I think matter uh, uh, is in consciousness, in the sense that what we call matter is a modality of experience in consciousness associated to, uh, with perception. Uh, I don't think matter is conscious, I think matter is in consciousness. Um, when we ask if, say, I have a mobile phone, when we ask, is this mobile phone conscious, we mean more than just to say that consciousness underlies the matter of my mobile phone. What mm -hmm. we mean is, does this mobile phone have a conscious inner life of its own as mm -hmm. a mobile phone? A private inner life of its own in the sense that I have a private inner life of my own. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think this mobile phone has a private inner life of its own. Mm -hmm. In the sense that I don't think that this mobile phone is the image of a dissociated altar of yep. universal consciousness, the right. way I am. I think biology, life is the image of dissociated alters mm -hmm. of uh, universal consciousness. Living things are the image of dissociated alters. Mm -hmm. Therefore, living things have a private inner life of their own. But the inanimate universe out there, uh, parts of it, like this phone or my table or my home thermostat, I don't think they have conscious inner lives of their own in the same way that a single neuron in my brain doesn't seem to have a conscious inner life of its own. Mm -hmm. There is something it is like to be me, in other words, there is something it is like to be my nervous system as a whole, but I don't think there is something it is like to be a single neuron in my head in and of itself. At least I don't experience that. Yeah. I only experience an integrated inner life that they associate with my entire nervous system, not individual neurons. In that exact same way, I don't think there is something it is like to be the moon or my mobile phone. But I do think there is something it is like to be the entire inanimate universe as a whole. And that is the inner life of mind at large. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, I do think consciousness underlies this phone in the same way that consciousness underlies a single neuron in my head. But I don't think there is something it is like to be this phone in and of itself in the same way that, uh, that I don't think there is something it is like to be a single neuron in and of itself. The entire inanimate universe as a whole is conscious, not parts of it, not subsets yeah. of it, like rocks and moons. That's so my view. you like to describe things that have an interior life as alters, right, as dissociated examples of mind at large. 
Things like the phone, the table, you describe those as excitations of consciousness, correct? Correct. And can you talk a bit about that? What, what does it mean to be an excitation of consciousness? An excitation of consciousness is what we call an experience. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, if we say that uh, all of existence uh, uh, is in consciousness, uh, then we have to, the next step in this line of reasoning, well, existence is dynamic, it happens, it unfolds. Uh, so what is that? Well, if it is all in consciousness, it can only be an excitation of consciousness. And if we need to visualize that, I think it's very difficult to visualize the subject, right? We tend mm -hmm. to visualize objects. And what I'm saying is that the whole of existence is actually uh, the inner life, even the dissociated inner life of one subject, that mm -hmm. there are no objects as such, only excitations of this one subject. Which is mind at large. But, which, is, which is universal consciousness. Yeah. I would reserve the term mind, of large, mind at large to whatever is not dissociated. Okay. But, but it's a technical detail. Uh -huh. um, but the best way to visualize it in terms of objects, I think, is to visualize universal consciousness as empty space. If you need to visualize it as an object, visualize it as empty space. And, and existence is the excitation of empty space, uh, which are experiences. The excitations of empty space are the things we experience, we and maybe mind at large itself. Uh, so that's the way I would put it forward. And mm -hmm. um, to, to go even further in this sort of inaccurate uh, visualization, which works as a metaphor, you could even visualize empty space as a kind of vibrating membrane mm -hmm. and uh, an existence or the experiences that we associate with matter, with uh, the unfolding of the universe as frequencies or patterns of vibration of mm -hmm. this membrane. Uh, and if you visualize it that way, you can even port the entire mathematical apparatus of superstring theory or M theory or quantum field theory to idealism. If you imagine that what is being excited, the quantum field that gets excited or the brains that vibrate or the superstrings that vibrate, uh, if they are consciousness itself, uh, then the whole thing comes together. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, so maybe just to kind of... Um follow up or clarify um, one point that maybe I, I missed. So um, in your writings, I guess I had concluded that um, you refer to mind at large or mind at large as unitary undivided consciousness, um, which you borrow from Aldo Shuxley, Doors of Perception, right? Um, and an Eastern f uh, philosophical mindset might refer to it as infinite consciousness, cosmic consciousness, Brahman, it, are those actually um, roughly equivalent, or is there a distinction that I that uh, maybe I missed between mind at large and those concepts? Well, you, you, if you, it depends on the, how you use the terms in a technical paper, but that's okay. that sort of hair splitting. I think uh -huh. uh, roughly they are equivalent. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I don't mind different names. I think all names are equally inappropriate. Okay, <laughs> gotcha. Um, and so. One thing that I that I that I wanted to touch on a little bit is um, so you know these are basically so experiences of cosmic consciousness or a unitary consciousness. I mean, a unitary consciousness, an experience of that would kind of be inherently non-dual, correct? Um, and so it's kind of a mystical experience. Um, and so your books are academic; they are not how-to books. But I, I'm curious. Um, you know, why that is, and what your own experience has been with any type of non-dual experience, how they came about, um, and if you'd be interested in, in talking about that. Sure. Um, um, <laughs> I'm willing to talk about anything. Uh -huh. um, so you're, you're coming to back to, to my own personal experiences, right? Because when yeah, you write... Uh, it could be your own personal experience or, you know just your own kind of um, thinking around how people that are, you know, hearing this conversation might actually, you know, go about having a non-dual experience. Huh. I, I, that's really not what I'm... It's not your thing, I know. good at in any yeah. way. Yeah. I'm, I'm not a spiritual, spiritual teacher right, in, yeah. in, in any sense of the word. The word. There are people out there who are 
a lot better. Mm -hmm. uh, they are, can be true spiritual teachers. I don't have a spiritual teacher, and I'm not a spiritual teacher. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you what I'm trying to do. Yep. Um, I'm talking concepts, mm -hmm. theories, um, perspectives, conceptual stuff. Is conceptual stuff uh, trans transforming? Does mm -hmm. it really change your life? Does it really make you feel different or experience the world differently? Mm -hmm. Hardly. Maybe a little bit. But they are not transformational yeah. uh, in that sense. Uh, a non-dual experience is transformation. Mm -hmm. and, it, uh, and it does not require concepts. Mm -hmm. You do not need to explain it to yourself or to somebody else. What is it that you experienced? Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, I mean, it's, it's uh, totally unnecessary. The experience is its own proof. Yep. It, it's so charged with a feeling of truth. Yeah. That you do not need to explain it to yourself in order to be to be convinced that it that that you experience something real, more mm -hmm. real than this, yep. than this right now, this everyday uh, life we have. Uh, so why do I do this? I do this for the following reason: we live in a society where people need to give themselves intellectual permission to embrace a different perspective, mm -hmm. even if they have a non-dual experience that is self-evidently true. And they know it is true. After 48 hours, they are already asking themselves, maybe I just you know, hallucinated something. It's yeah. unreliable stuff. Because they start to come back to, to this conceptual world we live in. We, we have hardly any contact with reality. Mm -hmm. We live in a conceptual mesh, a conceptual network yeah. in our heads that we project out there. We hardly see the world for what it is. We see the concepts we project on it, yeah. the explanations we project on it. Um, so we, we, we drift back to that. It's, it's like a, a black hole. It has uh, uh, irresistible gravitational pull. So yep. you may have a mind-boggling on dual experience. I tell you, within a month, if you're very lucky and you really had the strongest experience there is, you are back to questioning whether it was really valid and becoming skeptical about it. Back to the story we tell ourselves. Right. But if we have a conceptual, cultural narrative, uh, that you can absorb, that you believe in, that you can be skeptical about, check and say, well, this actually does make sense. And that's a handy explanation that also makes sense of that extraordinary experience I had. Mm -hmm. Then you give intellectual permission to stay there, yeah. to stay with that new perspective. And then your life changes. So what I'm trying to do is to construct an alternative cultural narrative right. that is also logical, parsimonious, and empirically grounded. That right. is as, at least as good as anything else, and hopefully much better than everything else out there. Right. And then people can give themselves intellectual permission to hold on to an experience they have already had, mm -hmm. or intellectual permission to even have the experience in the first place. Yeah. Because that has been my personal history, if you ask me. Mm -hmm. I was playing with these concepts before I had an unequivocal uh, non-dual experience myself. So it feels to me like I have had to give myself that intellectual permission first before I opened up uh, to an experience. I, I'm a very hard-headed <laughs> guy. You know, this, uh, this is tough stuff. It doesn't... You're cerebral. Doesn't my, yeah, I'm very cerebral. Yeah. Very. I, I live in a cage uh, constructed out of my own thoughts, mm -hmm. conceptualizations. So I, I needed this, and I think many people do need it as well. Yeah. So let me see if I'm getting this right. So this idea of idealism, this idea that consciousness is fundamental, is so important to you, and clearly it is, um, because the notion of physicalism, of materialism, undergirds not only scientific thought, our view of reality, but that view of reality also informs our culture and the way we live, which is itself predominantly materialistic. When you examine our lives, um, one of the reasons why they seem so deficient, so narrow, so unsatisfying, is because we live to acquire more shit. <laughs> um, and by changing that underlying worldview, um, to this notion that consciousness is actually what's fundamental, not matter, that can in turn change the cultural view and how we live our lives. Correct. Uh, let me just be clear. 
I I'm a proponent of idealism mm -hmm. because I think it is true. Yep. Not because I think it will make our lives better. No, I'm sorry. I, I, I didn't okay. mean to suggest uh, that. No, but... no. I, I, I know you didn't mean that. I'm, I'm just making this point yes. for the audience. Right. Uh, um, so uh, I think idealism is true in the sense, well, do we have direct access to truth? Hardly. I think idealism is the closest to truth we can get mm -hmm. on the basis of how the human brain works, how our mm -hmm. logic operates. Uh, our values, our you know, parsimony, the way we reason, and the evidence on the table. Mm -hmm. It's the closest we can get to truth. And that alone is reason to promote it. Because mm -hmm. why are we going to live in untruth? Right. Even if idealism would basically lead to uh, a, a terrible way of life, yep. a, 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 a sordid value system, even then I would still go for it if I thought it were true. Right. Now, in addition to it being true, I think it would also correct a lot of the craziness and stupidity that uh, governs uh, uh, human life uh, in the in, in 21st century. Yeah. Uh, I, I think a lot of our pain, uh, a lot of the destruction we inflict uh, in, on the world and on each other uh, uh, arises from this... Uh, I will use the word stupid worldview of materialism. Yeah. It is illogical. It flies in the face of evidence. It is self-contradictory. It's a very, very poor uh, narrative for making sense of the world, which also happens to lead to a very distorted and destructive value system. Um, yeah. So I think there is a, it's a double whammy. There, there are two irresistible reasons to to correct this right so really it's the love of the truth that sits above everything else this idea that consciousness is fundamental is what is true and that is what needs to be um, advanced but there are all these implications that flow from that being true and the culture and the way we live is really just one of them um, but there are there are there are also others, and one of the things that you'd like to point out is um, the implications for integrative mind-body medicine. Um, like, what do you think? Can you just expand on that a little bit? I think that's yeah. interesting. Yeah. It, it needs a little background. Yeah. So, my view is that a biological body mm -hmm. is the extrinsic appearance of a dissociated alter of universal consciousness. In other words, it's what an alter looks like from a second person perspective, from yeah. the perspective of another alter. Right. Uh, you are an alter. I am an alter. When my alter looks at your alter, what I see is your physical body. It's the image of that dissociated process in, in universal consciousness. Right. In the same way that a person suffering from multiple personality disorder, if you put that person in a brain scan, uh, the images you see uh, from from this person's brain, uh, 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 as a study showed in 2014, those images, you can use those images to discern dissociative processes in the mind of that person. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the universe is, uh, I use this in between quotes, a kind of nervous system. Yeah. We are in it, so we don't need a brain scan to see these dissociative processes. We are already inside it. Mm -hmm. uh, we just need to look around and, 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 and what we see is a living organism, the, the organisms. Mm -hmm. So a body then is the extrinsic appearance of dissociated mental processes. And not only the brain, the entire body. Now you may say, well, uh, uh, I can access my own thoughts, but I cannot access any mental activity that corresponds to my left big toe. It just seems to exist. It's out there. Well, then, then there's a question of, you know, consciousness and meta consciousness if there's a technical distinction you can have experiences that you do not do not know that you have you have the experiences you experience them but you don't know that you are experiencing them for instance mm -hmm. um, until i say this you do you are not aware that you are having the experience of breathing mm -hmm. But the moment I point to your breathing, the air flowing in and out of your nostrils, your, the inflation of your lungs, the movement of your diaphragm, now you become meta-conscious of your breathing. Not only you're having the experience of breathing, now you know that you are having the experience of breathing. And 30 seconds ago, oh. you were still having that experience, but you didn't know that you were having it. So 
we can only introspect into a subset of the experiences that correspond to our body. That's why we cannot access the inner life of the big toe, if, mm -hmm. if you will. Um, but I think the entire body corresponds to experience, not only the brain, the liver, the kidneys, yeah. the lungs, the muscles, the skin, right. everything that is alive in the body corresponds. It's the extrinsic appearance of experience. Mm -hmm. And that opens a whole new door for integrative uh, uh, medicine. If we treat the body as a mechanism, then doctors are mechanics and all they have uh, uh, as tools are the tools of mechanics. In other words, drugs and surgery, physical interventions with the body. Mm -hmm. But if we acknowledge that the entire body, every organ corresponds to uh, inner life, to inner experiences, even though we cannot access them through introspection, uh, depth psychology would call these experiences the unconscious. I think it's a misnomer. I don't mm -hmm. think it's unconscious at all. It's just beyond the, the, the range of introspection, but right. it's still a conscious experience. You refer that, or you refer to that as obfuscated consciousness, right? Obfuscated consciousness, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. uh, if the entire body corresponds to it, then you can influence any disease, any illness through the mental channel. Not mm -hmm. only through the physical channel of drugs and 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 um, and surgery, both are mental in, under my view. But one is associated with perception, and the other is associated with introspection, meditation, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, um, that channel opens, becomes validated, becomes l legitimized, so to say, uh, by idealism, and many other avenues of treatment, even placebo, mm -hmm. uh, even benign forms of misdirection mm -hmm. uh, could be validated. Because basically you're using the channel of introspection, the channel of beliefs, thoughts, inner emotions uh, uh, to correct an illness, to mm -hmm. correct a disease. Uh, you don't see anymore the body as a machine that you occupy from the distance of your head, uh, um, but as an integral part of your conscious inner life that can be affected uh, uh, through uh, psychological channels. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's what idealism offers, uh, the, the legitimization of psychological methods uh, as treatments and even cures for virtually uh, any disease. Now, of course, there are limits to this in practice. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have a genetic condition that is fully penetrant, you can meditate until you're blue in the face. You're probably mm -hmm. not going to change that because those are very, very, in, very inherent, deeply penetrating thought patterns yeah. that you can't even introspect into and you probably have to live with them forever. Yeah. Uh, but still, it pushes the boundaries much further uh, uh, regarding what can be achieved through the psychological channel. You would still describe that as a thought pattern, though, something that was genetic. It's just a, a very deep thought pattern. I think what we call genes, what we mm -hmm. call biology in general, is just the extrinsic appearance of certain thought patterns. Yeah. Uh, but from the ego, this part of mind that we uh, identify with and can control through volition, can introspect into, uh, is just a part of this universe of dissociated thoughts that mm -hmm. we call a human being. And the ego is not necessarily powerful enough to change all these patterns of thoughts. Yeah. Uh, um, there are bigger forces at play here. Right. But can, through the egoic channel, uh, can you influence that much deeper stuff? Mm -hmm. uh, I, th I think we can influence that, mm -hmm. yeah. I tend to agree with that. So one of the other interesting implications of idealism has to do with free will. So similar to the many worlds hypothesis, there are many prominent public intellectuals right now pushing the many worlds hypothesis. There are also a few prominent public intellectuals that like to tell you that you don't have any free will. What do you think about that, Bernardo? I think this dichotomy, free will and determinism, is a false dichotomy. Mm -hmm. It's a conceptual, conceptual game that is fundamentally mistaken. It only exists in words. It doesn't exist in reality. Um, I, I'll explain to you why. When we talk about this dichotomy, free will and determinism, the intuition is the following. Um, if my choice is being determined 
by factors that I cannot change, then it's deterministic and I don't have free will. Mm -hmm. uh, the alternative is my choice is not determined. So either my choice is determined, and then it's determinism, or it's not determined, and mm -hmm. then it's free will. But a non-determined choice is chaos. Yeah. Uh, it means that uh, it's not influenced by your preferences. It's not influenced by your goals. Uh, it's undetermined. It's the flip of a coin. It's random. Mm -hmm. That's not what we mean either by free will. So my point is there is no semantic space between these two polarities. Yeah. Uh, you cannot have something that is both non-determined and non-random. Mm -hmm. It doesn't exist. I think what we, if you really meditate into this, what we mean by free will is the choice is determined, but it's only determined by factors that I identify myself with. Right. And so that's so really my the, choice. Yeah. That's, my, that's my really choice the key. Is, yeah. yeah. So my choice is determined by my thoughts and I identify with my thoughts. Yeah. I am my thoughts. Right. So I have free will. But right. it's still completely determined by the patterns that govern the unfolding of thoughts. Yeah. It's fully determined. Yeah. The only difference is that the agent that makes that determination is something I identify myself with. Mm -hmm. And then I say, oh, I have free will. And because we don't identify with neurons in our head of mm -hmm. course not we identify with our subjective in a life right i don't feel that i am neurons or subatomic particles bouncing around inside my skull i don't right. feel that yep but if a materialist tells you well that's what you are well i don't feel that i am that you're telling me that i am that but i don't identify with it if my choices are determined by those bouncing subatomic particles then i don't have free will right because I don't identify with those bouncing, bouncing subatomic particles. Right. But the moment I come and say those bouncing subatomic particles are not what you are. They are simply the image of what you are yeah. from a second person perspective. Right. They are what, what you are looks like yeah. from an external point of view. That's all there is to those bouncing subatomic particles. Right. They are the image of what you are from the point of view of another person. But what you really are yeah. is your conscious in their life, is your thoughts, your emotions, your preferences, your opinions, and so on. And your choices are indeed determined by your thoughts, your emotions, your opinions, and so on. Therefore, from that perspective, there is what people call free will. But then I would be even more careful because we just said that beyond these thoughts you identify yourself, yourself with, thoughts that you can access through introspection, your ego, beyond that there is the so-called unconscious or the obfuscated mind, which is also part of your dissociated alter, but you don't identify with that. Mm -hmm. You think you're just your ego. You don't think you are the rest, the mm -hmm. obfuscated mind. I think this obfuscated mind is much more powerful in determining your choices mm -hmm. than your egoic uh, thoughts. Uh, your choices are determined by things that we don't even guess. The, it's like we are a tiny little ego boat sitting on top of raging high seas. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and we can point the rudder in a certain direction, right. but you're not going to go necessarily in that direction. The winds, the currents, the waves, they're going to drag you in another direction. Um, and I think that, unfortunately, is the reality of the situation. Yeah. Our choices are being governed by conscious factors right. in mind even in our own dissociated mind let alone mind at large that we do not identify ourselves with mm -hmm. and then from that broader perspective i would say our free will is very very limited can you choose your next thought can you choose not to have an obsession mm -hmm. or a compulsion can you choose not to feel a certain way i mean can you even choose really your partner yeah. Is it really what you identify with that chooses your partner, the partner in life, the person you, you marry or that you make love with? Or is it all kinds of other things that are going on at a deep emotional level that you don't identify yourself with, that you may even say, I'm a victim of that. I'm a victim of my projections, mm -hmm. uh, of the patterns imprinted on me since my childhood. Uh, I think that's the question left for meditation. Yeah. But at the level of universal consciousness as a whole, of course there is free will, because universal consciousness as a whole is all there is. Mm -hmm. So nothing can happen that is determined by a factor outside universal consciousness. 
So from the point of view of universal consciousness, if you don't identify with your ego, if you don't identify with your body, if you identify with all of existence, then everything happens as it has to because it's determined. And at the same time, everything happens as you, universal consciousness, wants it to happen. Uh, at that level, necessity is the same as preference. You prefer what is needed, and what is needed is what you prefer, you as universal consciousness. Mm. Things only get confused when dissociation comes into play, and then we get lost in identifying with subsets of the whole, and then, yeah, is there free will, is there not, and it depends on what you identify mm -hmm. yourself with. You're uh, pretty clear, though, that the way that you make your way through dissociation is through meditation, though, right? I think life is the image of dissociation. Mm -hmm. I think the only way you will really overcome dissociation is when you die. Yeah. Because if life is the image of dissociation, what's the image of the end, the overcoming of dissociation? It's death. Yeah. It's the end of life. For as long as you have a living, breathing body, I think you are dissociated. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that you are that that you can't have little temporary partial excursions into yeah. non dissociated land. Mm -hmm. uh, you can. Uh, some of that happens spontaneously. We have testimonies of people throughout history that have had spontaneous experiences of uh, uh, ex spontaneous non-dual experiences, uh, what uh, Richard Burke called um, uh, a cosmic consciousness. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't mean that you died. Probably your brain activity reduced significantly, like psychedelics do. They reduce your brain activity significantly. Right. That reduction is probably correlated with a reduction in dissociation. So you get access to territory beyond your dissociative boundary, boundaries, which you remember after you come back. Mm -hmm. um, so you can have those experiences. I think non-dual experiences have to do with making the dissociative boundary more porous. Yeah, uh, not as restrictive. It sort of relaxes those boundaries. You can go across them, experience okay. something, and come back. Which, from uh, a second for... person perspective, has to do with reduced, not increased, brain activity, right? And I think a lot of people think it's the opposite. There is a very consistent pattern uh, linking uh, reduced brain activity to experiences of transcendence. Yeah. Uh, uh, mystical experiences, religious experiences, psychedelic experiences. Uh, I mentioned just a few examples. Psychedelics uh, uh, operate by reducing brain metabolism, brain activity. They reduce blood flow and blood oxygenation uh, throughout the brain, particularly in the default mode network, which is associated with the ego, <laughs> interestingly. Mm. Um, um, partial strangulation. Uh, a dangerous game that teenagers play worldwide called the choking game. Right. They partly strangle themselves and restricting blood flow uh, to the to the brain. Uh, so brain activity reduces, brain metabolism reduces, uh, and they have uh, amazing transpersonal experiences. Uh, they, they trip, so to say. Yeah. They trip on the edge just by partly strangling themselves. Dangerous game. Nobody should do that. You're much better off meditating or, yeah. or doing breathing exercises yeah. because hyperventilation incre increases blood alkalinity and it causes constriction of blood vessels in the brain so brain activity gets reduced uh, um, so if you hyperventilate in the correct way uh, you will pass out uh, but while you're passed out you're not unconscious you're having amazing transcendent experiences and then you come back yeah um, even mystics there was a study done in Brazil I think 2013 um, they have these mediums self-proclaimed mediums that claim to have access to some transcendent source of information and they write down this transcendent information that they get some some scientists in Brazil decided to test this and they put these mediums in a functional brain scanner while they were psychographing, which is the name, which is sort of transcri transcribing information from a transcendent source. And guess what? When they did that, they could write incredibly complex te text. There are mm. measures of complexity that you can apply. They could write more complex text than a normal person writing, uh, uh, just trying to write as best as they can. These yeah. mediums could, could write more complex text. Um, and because their brain activity was being monitored, they saw, they saw that brain activity reduced in key areas of the brain uh, associated with writing complex t text. Hmm. Uh, 
uh, so uh, another reason to believe uh, in, in this link. Also, as I studied in Italy, uh, people were studied for feelings of self-transcendence before and after brain surgery for the removal of tumors, and this surgery always causes collateral damage, impairs brain function. And guess what? After surgery, these people have uh, uh, much stronger feelings of self-transcendence. They mm. don't identify themselves purely with their bodies anymore. They identify with the world at large. Very peculiar. Even Vietnam War veterans uh, who had... Um, brain damage there was a study in 2016 over a hundred of them were studied and uh, brain damage was correlated with having more mystical experiences so brain function impairment reduced brain activity yeah. uh, reduced f from the perspective of the baseline uh, is associated with transcendent non-dual mystic mystic experiences and uh, that for materialism is very hard to reconcile because under materialism brain activity is experience or uh -huh. generates experience right. so how can you have richer experience with less brain activity right uh, the materialists are trying to solve this puzzle now i actually yes. have a, an essay on scientific american it's coming out anytime now that that will criticize their attempt to make sense of this um but from from my point of view if if normal brain activity is the image of dissociation, if you impair that brain activity in the right way, you will reduce dissociation. And that naturally leads to transcendent, non-dual mystical experiences. That makes sense. Um, so that's more powerful evidence against materialism as it relates to consciousness. But uh, you've got a new book coming out, as I understand it, right? Uh, the that's idea correct. of the world, where you're going to tackle the concept of space-time. Want to talk a bit about that? Amongst other things. Uh, yeah, among, the yeah. idea of, yeah, uh, it's my seventh book. Mm -hmm. um, the other books, as you mentioned, the other six, are for what I like to call an educated audience, and I don't mean by that school education. Right. Uh, there are many people who are self-educated, and, and they put uh, schooled people to shame, yes. <laughs> if, if you know what I mean. Uh, but these are not... Uh, 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 magazine level books uh, in the sense that it requires some some attention to mm -hmm. go through the arguments but they were target at a general audience a general educated audience and with this seventh book i am targeting squarely um, the academic world mm -hmm. the book is still accessible to a general audience but it it's 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 the most rigorous book i've written um it's sort of a if there, if, if there is a, a court of scientific and philosophical arbitration, this book is my case for that court, <laughs> if you know what I mean. It's, uh -huh. it's, um, it's, I, I go into detail into every possible counter argument. Uh, I, I, it's almost hair splitting. Uh -huh. uh, it's very explicit, very detailed. Um, and it's my attempt to complete my work by covering that hole, covering that gap. The part about space-time comes at the end of the book, and um, and the idea there is the following: uh, for the idealist, uh, the only fundamental thing in nature is experience. That means that not even space-time is fundamental. Hmm. Space-time, for the idealist, are certain qualities of experience. Space is a quality associated uh, with relationships between objects perceived on the screen of perception. That's what we call space. I have an object here, I have an object there. These are perceived on the screen of perception. There's a relationship between them that I call the space. Less mm -hmm. space, more space. But it's a relationship between contents of perception. And time is the quality associated with memory and expectations. Um, what is the past but a memory? Mm -hmm. Can you point to the past and say, there is the past? Right. It's not out there. The past only exists insofar as we experience it now, as a memory. There has never been a moment in your life in which the past was anything else than this. Mm -hmm. And a memory has certain qualities, definiteness, things that you can't change anymore, low resolution because you, you don't quite, you can't quite visualize them uh, with high resolution anymore. Same thing for the future. You can't point at it and say, there's the future. The future at any point in your life has only ever existed as a set of expectations that you experience now expectations experienced in the present um, and there are certain qualities associated with these these expectations openness um, uh, um, a, a lack of definition 
a certain uh, overlap of possibilities. These are qualities of the experience of expectations that you have now. Uh, so for the idealist, there is no time. There are only qualities of experience. The problem is that uh, once an idealist uses language, he's already operating within space and time because yeah. language presupposes space and time. Mm. Uh, verbs are things that unfold in time. Nouns refer to things that exist in space. So uh, the idealist is forced into using space-time language as a metaphor to point to something that is inherently not dependent on space-time. Another problem is that uh, even the idealist like me uh, will describe uh, experiences uh, metaphorically as uh, vibrations or excitations of consciousness. Remember, we talked about it in the beginning. We yeah. could visualize uh, universal consciousness as space and experiences as vibrations, excitations of space. But an excitation, a vibration, requires space and time to exist. Mm -hmm. Vibrations are movements in space that unfold across time. So when, I, when the idealist says that uh, experiences are like vibrations of consciousness, that's a metaphor. There is something outside space-time that from within space-time we can best describe as a vibration or, or an excitation. But that doesn't mean that the, ideal, the idealist is granting that there exists a fundamental sp space-time scaffolding out there within which experience is unfolding, uh, unfolds. No, the idealist says that space and time exists within, uh, exist within consciousness as qualities of experience. Mm -hmm. Well, I will definitely look forward to reading that. It's called The Idea of the World. Check it out, folks. Um, I think we could probably talk for quite a long time, but we should probably look to wrap this up. Uh, thanks so much for joining us, Bernardo. Um, check out his books on Amazon.com. If you like this podcast, you think it's useful, please share it up, give us a review, um, and we'll talk to you next time. Take care. Thanks for having me.